Love your neighbor as yourself, arguably the greatest commandment given to us by Jesus and possibly the hardest to keep. So is it especially shocking when the Church of England has to acknowledge there's still racism in its midst, That's something they first acknowledged in 1987? Well, this week the House of Bishops announced it's working on a plan to double the number of minority ethnic clergy in senior positions over the next decade. Now, there are currently fewer than five. Is the Church of England institutionally racist? Uh, lay member of the Synod, Alison Ruoff, is there a big problem here? No. <laughs> is that the debate over, or, yeah, or right. do we need to, no? do we need to carry on our, uh, our discussion? There isn't, there isn't a problem. No, I don't think there is a problem. I think it's blown out of all proportion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually think that every church... No, I correct that. Not every church is as welcoming, perhaps, as they should be, but most churches are. Um, and people... Uh, but yours like, is the state church. It's the established church. Well, what's and that got it, to do with it? Is it well? I'll tell you because it, is it properly reflecting modern society? Given that there was a survey out this week, uh, by about 2050, one third of this country are not going to be white. So you have to do something about it. You have to move through the times. Otherwise, the Church of England will surely become irrelevant. The Church of England won't become irrelevant, as far as I can see. It might it might divide at some point over various issues, but it's not irrelevant. Uh, it's, it's really important. It's, uh, it's, uh, as at the moment, because it's the established church, therefore there's the opportunity to, uh, for the Christian message to go to every house in every parish. Whether it does or not is another matter. Uh, but I, I do think that we, get, we work ourselves up into a frenzy about this uh, institutional racism. Mm. Uh, if you go to a church in a, in a village, say in the depths of Devon or Norfolk, you might not see any people of an ethnic minority because simply they don't live there. Uh, if you go to a church in central London, you'll probably see a lot of people of all sorts of uh, ethnic minorities all worshipping together and all getting on very well. well we could walk out the door <coughs> here at Goldsmiths. Uh, Indeed. Here, but there'd be five within walking distance, within a stone's throw almost, five Pentecostal churches that are full to the brim yes. on a Sunday morning. Yes, that's wonderful. Morning. Sorry? That's wonderful. Hmm. Uh, but people like to be with their own. And I think we have to remember that. They do. You know, if, if you, if, well, for example, if you all come from France, if you've got lots of French neighbours, will you tend to go and be with your French neighbours? I thought the point of the church was that everyone was well. But it is, it is true. You, well, why do people, if you're, if you're in, the, in central London, in Oxford Circus, say, where you hear everybody speaking their own language in their groups. They don't all suddenly start speaking English. I mean, I so, think, well, uh, well, unless think, well, they have to. Cole. I think we need to make a very strong demarcation here between the experience in churches that Alison is talking about, wherever they may be, whatever parish they may be, they're all very different, and the experience of the church, the institution of the church. Alison will know full well that in 1985, when Faith in the City report came out, one of the things that was <coughs> hidden away in that, but was still a very clear message to the Church of England was, mm -hmm. there is an ongoing massive incoming of people from the Caribbean, from Africa and Asia, and those people are Christians and they're believers, and unless you are welcoming and open to them, you will not actually engage with them. That's what has happened. The Church of England has not engaged with them. The Pentecostal Church is growing enormously in London, not just because people want to flock together, as you put it, Alison, but because in many cases, when they came, they were not welcome in Absolutely. their local church. Absolutely. 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 I know that in my own experiences, for instance, my parents, like my mother, they were, they were not welcomed in Anglican churches, so they had to splinter off and create their own churches. Can I ask you, what did that not welcomed in Anglican churches well, I would, mean? I How remember, did it manifest itself? Well, I even remember as a kid when, you know, when we used to go to church, it was just staid and dry and dead and boring when we used to go to the ordinary church. It was just... The preacher says something, people like the performing seals, they'll clap every now. There was no interaction. Anthropology, no joy. We call it. There was no joy, there was no spirit. You couldn't really be emotive. If the, if the pre My mother always says that if you go to church and the preacher doesn't move you with the word, he's not doing his job. Although, to be fair, well, there is, that, there is joy and pleasure in the Anglican church all over the place. Of course there is. You just got the wrong one. Maybe I'll see. <laughs> or maybe as, a, maybe as a child I was experienced. Yeah. And also, there is that perception, it's a bit stayed. Maybe, maybe you should go to one of these service hours, let your hair down, feel... I haven't got feel, long enough hair. You could let it down, whatever you got. Feel the spirit, it's feel that way. It's not a question of style, Nicky. John Root, John. I think the point is, Alison says, people like to be with their own. And, you know, you see that in all sorts of ways. 
you have to say, is that Christianity? Because the Christian faith has a, a very powerful vision of people of every nation and tribe of and language course. gathering Absolutely. together in worship. Uh, and the failure of the Church of England is that's not exhibited with sufficient enthusiasm, energy, vigour, uh, because plans aren't made to make it that way. Mm. You know, it's, it's institutional a, racism. So there needs to be a, a conscious effort. Oh, and you want to come in, and we'll hear from well, the audience too. Then, Alison, in a minute. Sorry, Alison, you, your point is just not true. I mean, we live in this hugely diverse city, for example, London. In Britain, we have some of the highest levels of mixed race relationships on the face of the earth. People in this city, in particular, and elsewhere, they live together, they work together. They even sleep together in some cases. They're setting up families, they're living together. And I have to say, if the church is going to die, it will be because of people like you. you because one in seven people, one in seven people I, now I, only I go to a religious Alison service. Come, you, Alison it's not representative Let me ask you a question. Diverse. Do you go to church? No, I don't go to church. Right, so how do you know? Well, well, Come on. Exactly. How do you know? I'll turn, that on, I'll turn that on its head. Why are so few people of my generation going to churches? And but I would you, suggest you, uh, it's because it's seen as completely out of date. To Alison Ruoff. My daughter... Alison Ruoff and Owen Jones. It's a dream ticket, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Alison Ruoff. My daughter goes to a church that's not an Anglican church. She goes to Hillsong from Australia. And on Easter Sunday, they had 10,000 young people going to church. Um, on, on Good Friday, uh, they had 450 young people baptised. Now, you can't tell me Christianity is dead in this country. I didn't say it was dead. I said, no, it, but I said it, people it, like it, you will ensure that it people, won't be relevant. I'm sorry, but I believe that young people are most welcome in the Church of England, and in any church. It doesn't have to be the Church of Alison, England. I Alison, just I want to... I, just I, want I, want, I want to establish something. I just want to know that everybody who goes to church can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's what I care about. In, what, what, in whatever way they, exactly. they hear it. One second. John Root. What's best the, for them? Is the, let's get back to it. Is the Church of England institutionally racist? Yeah, because I think institutional that, yes. racism yeah. isn't just being yeah. unkind, nasty to people. You know, we, we often have a, quite a simplified view of what racism is. It's more subtle. It's much more subtle, yeah. And it's the way the institution chooses to operate. And institutions tend to operate in the way that those who lead are comfortable with. Uh, and that's different from the way that ordinary people, most ordinary white people, but certainly ordinary black people as well feel. Uh, and therefore there's that sort of exclusion which in a sense Les was indicating when he said it, it's boring and so on. Because that's not just black people who think that, white people who think that as well. Yeah. You know, so it needs to be uh, an intentional desire to change the way we operate, that it does actually facilitate and develop the gifts that black people bring how do we to get a, how do we get a situation facilitated under in just one second where, whereby there are there are more not just johnson tamu and a few others but there are more black leaders in the church of england how do we get there Les? well for me first of all you know we have to have the right conversation you know every historical cause has a contemporary consequence we know that the, the church of england anglican church whatever all of them were involved in african chattel enslavement all of them I think only the Quakers weren't involved in that. It's a long time ago, though. It doesn't matter if it's a long time ago, because how you have to think about it is, think about it in this way. If you're a black person and you're in this congregation and it's more or less an all-white congregation, you're in there. Or it could be an all-black congregation with a white vicar priest or whatever. And you cannot see yourself in that position because, one, continuously reinforced through the images, God is white, Jesus is white, you can never aspire to be God. You can never aspire to be Jesus. You can walk in Jesus' footsteps, but can you be like him? These things cause dissonance mm. because you don't see yourself represented in that picture. Then would you be surprised that those people are cowed and don't put themselves forward yeah. for these higher positions? Because if they're getting treated like that, as members of the congregation, what is that going to be like if they get to those higher <laughs> echelons? Thank you. And Alison, I know you want to come back. An audience in a second. And... Uh, Andrew too. Yeah. The thing is, Les, the majority of Anglicans in the world mm. are black. That's right. The majority are in Africa, yes. mm. actually. And the Church of England needs to learn from that and, and engage with that and has a problem with engaging that, particularly over the issue of same-sex marriage at the moment. But we, I think we have to be really clear. I go to church, Alison. I go to lots of churches, actually. And I see lots of churches where there are people of mixed race and people of different colours mm. and people of back, and different backgrounds. And they're fantastic. But the issue here is institutional racism, and that is not reflected in the House of Bishops or the leadership of the church, and that is an anomaly and a disgrace. Reverend Andrew Symes. 
Yes, I think, I mean, it's a very serious charge if people are saying there's, there's institutional racism because, as, as, as has been mentioned already, part of the Christian gospel is that it's, it's for everybody, mm -hmm. that it's not to, for, you know, it's, it's, it's available for everyone of whatever culture. And I think perhaps we need to ask, is there something in the culture of the Church of England, particularly the leadership of the Church of England, which, it, you know, it's not that, that people are deliberately excluding other people, it's just there's something in the culture which is which is not attractive. And I think what's been said is well, that... Well, it could be a self-perpetuating elite. Well it, well, it could be, exactly. And I think that's true with a lot of, a lot of organisations, not, not just the church. And so I think this, yeah. this process you of think asking the, the question... all organisations yeah. would struggle, strive to be immune from that? Yeah, but I think, as has already been mentioned, there are churches which are packed with people of all sorts of different, ra different races. And the question, perhaps, is to ask them, um, especially... Uh, churches, um, black majority churches, let's say, uh, where um, people are praising the Lord, they are uh, confident in themselves, confident in the gospel, in their, in, the, in their mission to their particular community, ask them, uh, what is it about the Church of England that, 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 that doesn't attract Absolutely. you, which is, what, which is what Les was saying. It may be to do with Star of Worship. But, but you 30 see, years too late because we had... But, the, no, you see, to me, it's, it's not too late because one mm. of the, we were having a discussion upstairs and one of the things we said was, in 2007, great inroads were made, maybe for the wrong reason, when it was a so-called 200 years since the abolition of the slave trade. But I know I was invited into more churches and mosques during that year than I ever have been in my life to have these kind of conversations. At the time, I just published a book called Whiteness Made Simple. And in that book, I spoke about being raised as a Judeo-Christian child and how that affected and impacted me when I started to look at, on one hand, we're, we're encouraged to praise the Lord, you know, everybody is welcome in the house of the Lord. But the Lord didn't look like us. And if you speak to black people, on his point, yeah. if you speak to black people and you say to a lot of them, and if they're honest, then you say to them, how do you feel about a white Jesus? How would you feel about replacing it with a black Jesus? They will invariably say, God no have no colour. Jesus he, doesn't have a Jesus colour. Jesus wasn't white. Rather than, con no, rather than to confront the history. in but, Palestine. No, but you're, 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 you're missing my audience. point. The yeah. point is <clears throat> that... That is the image, the Warner Salman images that have been ingrained in everyone's consciousness. That's the image of this particular <laughs> culture. Hands up on that point. Hands up on that. Alice and I will be with you. Two gentlemen there at the back in the, in the cream jacket. What would you like to say? Yeah, uh, I'm an atheist and I'm also from an organisation called the London Black Atheists and the uh, answer is simple. When you look at the character of religion in contemporary society today, you see that more often than not, contained within today's religion is misogyny, sexism, mm. racism. When you look at all the, the Quran do you think, and the Bible... Yeah, do you think that... Look, talking about the Church of England specifically, do okay. you feel from your experience, from what people have told you, from what you've heard, that uh, those things are part of attitudes within the Church of England? Yes, it is. I yeah. mean, uh, they were responsible for partaking in the slavery. It's well, very... Uh, come down, and it's further along. Yeah, what's your point? Yeah, I'm also from London Black Atheists. Oh, uh, they're all sitting oh, together. That's uh, yes, you thank see, you. You're right, Alison. People like to stick together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. Go on. All religions are basically institutionally racist because of not. The, 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 moment you, the moment you have a religion, you have an in group and an out group. And therefore, uh, Anybody, you have okay. your chosen people yeah. or whatever it is, well, they're it's institutionally oh, okay. racist. Right, got you. Are, you, are, you from, are you from the black atheists? Uh, I'm not. Oh, right. I'm not. I, I, <laughs> I was actually baptised in the Church of England. Right, okay, right. Sorry. But then, um, later on, I actually changed my mind not to actually be with the Church of England. Um, there are key where, things. where do you worship now, may I? Now I actually worship with the um, Catholic Church. Right which again, I know they have quite a lot of issues also going with them, but um, I would say that um, Church of England is actually kind of like disconnect itself from the African fellowship. So most of the issue that um, the Africans have in the church are always not listened to. 
Well, like and, the, and the you know, Africans. Equal marriage and so forth. And the, yes, yeah, okay, right, okay. they do have some strong views in there, but the thing is, they feel that the church is unwilling to listen to any of their views. Alison Ruff, that's interesting, this paradox about the, the massive uh, power of the Anglican church and popularity in Africa. But on the point about the, the, you know, what, what Les has raised about the, the, the feeling of being excluded and the historical reasons of slave trade, what's your response to that? Well, I wasn't around in the middle of the slave trade. Um, I have yeah, not was I. Well, <laughs> or at least I hope I weren't. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, we, we've, moved, we've moved a long way since perhaps the time when your parents came to this country. And I think in the 60s we didn't do at all well at welcoming peace, people from, particularly from the Caribbean nations. And um, I, I apologise for that. Uh, well, but we have learned a lot. And I go to a church <laughs> which is in a white middle class area and our congregation is composed of all sorts of people and all sorts of colours, Asians, black people, um, all sorts. And, and, uh, and we, we get on really well. Having said that, we haven't, I think we've only got one person of an ethnic minority on the PCC. Yeah, that's the problem, now, isn't it? Well, we've, we've had Asian people on the PCC, but they won't stand or they don't want to stand. Why not? Well, they don't want the responsibility, they want to do other things, and so on. You see, and this is... Not, you see, this is a this, in, but It's what, not what, in a always easy to get people to do these, these particular jobs. I would love more people to come and Why do Why don't that. they want the responsibility? I have no idea, but... They, but this, this but is the white kind of people conversation are, not, are, saying, are just the same. But this is the kind of conversation I'm saying that perhaps you should have. We do you have know? it. We try but and persuade because people, what I'm saying is if you can, come if, and join us. But if you can kind of go to the... If you can kind of go to the default that they don't want to accept the responsibility. That's like when they used to say, oh, black, black youth in England don't want to work because they used to smoke weed all the time or they're getting high and all this kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. At the end of the day, what you need is you need a clear conversation. We I, do I, have conversations. I run, I run courses with a group called Black History Studies where we interrogate these things. And I, every time I run this course, I'll have Christians in there, black, maybe white, and they will say, we do not have this quality of debate or discussion. So people just dismiss the fact that there isn't representation because people don't want to be responsible. Now, well, that's not what there, there, was a, there was a famous sociologist who said that my position is my possession. Richard Sennett, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's the guy. Yeah, my position yeah. is my possession. Is that the problem? Is the problem, John Root, in the pews or is it in the hierarchy? The purple shirts. Yeah, it, it, it's in <laughs> the nation in a sense because, you know, I think we... We terrify the phrase institutional racism or the phrase racism, but it's endemic because it's a generalised attitude amongst white people of superiority, of not expecting much from black people. Oh, and no. and if, if you actually listen closely to black people in the Church of England, you know, there's this sense of not being affirmed, of not being welcomed, uh, not, you know, not, not in a very overt way at all. Uh, Nikki, but in, in quite a subtle way. And I, I, yeah, carry on, John. I want to come to the lady there yeah. in a second. If you don't uh, mind so her. people I know who are training for ministry, for example, you know, would, they wouldn't say people are racist in the sense <laughs> you're told to go away or you're not welcome. But there's a lack of interest, a lack of enthusiasm, Absolutely. a lack of readiness to learn, uh, which actually inhibits people. You know, so that it's, yeah, it's in the pews. It's ordinary white people actually not having that zest to learn, to develop, to say, what do these people bring to the table? Yes, a, a, a la lady, lady there. Um, you're yes, married to a clergyman, aren't you? Yes, and I Which am. clergyman are you married to? <laughs> to John Rose. <laughs> to him? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what, what's your... Exp I know we had a little conversation earlier and you said, oh, I'm not sure if I want to speak. Yes. I'm glad you do want to speak. What's yes. your experience been? Have you felt any sort of hostility over the years? Yes, I will say I did feel hostility. And I would not say that it came from everyone, but it did. It does exist and it actually, in order to foster, you actually need to get to the other person's side. Like when Alison said that, I don't know why they don't want to take responsibility, that just shows that you don't really understand why Absolutely. they have, why, is, why did you Absolutely. get that impression? I think that needs to be. So I think it's very important that we need to listen and actually to affirm. And in order to affirm, you need to recognize the gifts that we, as an, I identify, as an ethnic minority, I have gifts, we all have gifts and you want to use it. Beautiful. It is a problem in society as a whole, though, Nick. I mean, look, look at, this pa look at this panel. We're in London, and all of us, apart from one, are white. Look at the lack of black MPs. Look at the lack of black journalists. Well, we have this a is black a problem Archbishop. all of us have to deal with, but mm. it's a very small minority, so it's a social no, problem. There are only two Archbishops, and one is white and one is black. No, but if, you look, the, if you look at the <laughs> 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 after that, there's none. No, uh, and, and John, John, same time. 
was we, raised well, we overseas. Hang on. We so we, we've not actually developed black British ministers, clergy, senior but leaders. But look at the at numbers. Well, look, the number is, of black people just, compared with white people in terms of the whole not, of the nation. It's not there aren't that many in numbers. percentage. No, I mean, but, it's not uh, about numbers, is it? It's about institutional racism. Absolutely. And for me, a telling point in what you said was, I don't know why they don't want to get involved. One thing, as has been said, is to go and talk to people. Of course we talk but, to people. But the other thing is that we need to all be open, whether it's in a sexist context, a racist context, whatever context we're talking about it in, we need to be prepared to change and move our institutions to change the way that they operate. Mm. So it's not about saying, why don't you want to take a role in my institution as it is? Mm -hmm. It's about saying, what is it about this institution this that we all need to change? This, <laughs> this is a church. This is a church. This is a church whereby is everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter who they are, what colour or anything. They're okay. welcome. A last word, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I think, I think there is a problem generally in society, as, uh, as was mentioned here, also about participation yes. in, 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 vo in volunteerism. That's right. Mm. Uh, I think that's, a pr that's probably a case in, 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 in many institutions. And so I think there is a challenge to the church in terms of its welcome. There's a constant challenge for that. There's a constant challenge in terms of persuading people of all different types. I mean, you could talk, talk about white working class men or any other group um, in order to, to encourage people who perhaps don't feel that, you know, as you say, they look at the, the, the thing and they say that that's not me. There is a challenge for that, in encouraging participation, and that's true for the church, but it's true for all other voluntary organisations. Thank you all well. so much indeed. Thank you for that. And <laughs> thoughts will come in. And uh, you can join in all this morning's debates. Log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions and follow the link to the online discussion. And, of course, uh, you can tweet using the, the hashtag BBCTBQ. And tell us what you think about our last big question, too. Are fathers doing their fair share? Now, if you'd also like to be in the audience at a future show, you can email audiencetbq at menton.tv. And we're looking for audiences uh, for Walsall on May the 25th and Brighton on June the 15th. Next week, we're back here at Goldsmiths with a special big questions asking... Did the First World War change Britain for the better? Uh, Brigadier Sir Hugh Strewn, Jeremy Paxman, Professor David Stevenson and Frank Ledwidge are amongst those taking part. So do join us. <laughs> Finland, Norway, Sweden, Iceland and Denmark are the best five countries in the world to be a mother, uh, according to a Save the Children survey this week. The UK came 26th, equal with Belarus, down three places from last year. Perhaps one factor is, although mothers are now the main breadwinners in a third of uh, British couples with children, they still do most of the housework, cooking and caring. Are fathers doing their fair share? Um, Dr Pam Spur, lifestyle coach. Was it 26th, equal with Belarus? That's even worse than last night in the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> It's not great, is it? Um, um, I'm not surprised at all because uh, men are not pulling their weight. The Institute of Public Policy did a large study in 2012 which found that 8 out of 10 married women still do the majority of the housework and that over the last few decades we just haven't seen this change. Now, Nikki, one of the three top reasons why people divorce is neglect, feeling neglected feeling lack of respect, because it's not the big things that break a couple up, like, oh, where, which city should we live in? Because people realize as a couple, well, yeah, I can see their point of view on a big issue. It's the little things when a man won't help lay the table, won't pick up after the kids, won't, you know, do a washing. Those are the things that erode your relationships and damage them. Mm. Rebecca, come in here, because you've written a, a book, which is, uh, that's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, shattered, modern, modern motherhood and the illusion of equality. Uh, there are some, perhaps some would say, very old-fashioned attitudes that persist. Hello, honey, I'm home. A woman's work is never done. Yeah. All that stuff. How, how much is it cultural? Yeah. Well, I think um, the interesting thing is a lot of it's cultural, but it's absolutely linked to the supporting structures and the legislation in a country. And I think it's no accident that the uh, countries that come out top in that Save the Children research in terms of uh, having a good environment for mothers are exactly the same cu countries that encourage fathers to do as much as possible. So these are countries that... Uh, 
that lay down very firm cultural expectations that fathers will play their fair share in the household. They're the countries that have, um, that do as much as possible to um, bring fathers in in the early days of childcare so they have shared parental leave. And hard so habits to well, break in this country. No? Hard, hard habits to break and it takes determination and focus <coughs> and actually a bit of a stick as well as a carrot to get fathers involved. So what those countries have is they have a long length of ring fence paternity leave for fathers so that it's use it or lose it. Fathers either take that paternity leave or it completely falls away. The mother can't take it up. And it forces fathers, in just the same way that mothers are forced, to come to terms with childcare. It's funny that that's seen as a stick, used. isn't it? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a carrot and it's a stick. <laughs> and, you know, uh, uh, parenthood is learnt on the job and you have to take a deep breath and you get in there and it's really, really hard and it's really, really rewarding and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's two sides of the same coin and I'm sure that the mothers and fathers in this room would agree with that but you've got to get in there in the first place. Well, and we are in 2014 and we still do not have pay parity between men and women. So mm. outside of the home, we are so lackadaisical about the 15.7% difference that women earn outside the home, we still have the pervasive mm. attitude within the home that women are still going to get along well, and not just true. do we the do, things. We do have pay parity. We do not no, offer no, the national do. statistics. This is how we have pay parity. In our 20s and 30s, men and women get paid the same. We don't have a gender, a gender pay gap. We have a parenting pay gap. The pay gap only kicks in when we start to force mothers to be the main carer and force, don't please, force fathers to be the main earner. You only have to look at the countries at the top of the list where, where, where the roles are shared more equally. Fathers have equal rights. Father, we've given women equal rights in the workplace, the equal opportunities going to work. We have not given fathers an equal right to take on the role of being the carer unless you get equal it's two sides of the same coin unless you give equal rights to fathers as well as equal rights to mothers as happened more in the scandinavian countries nothing will change i've got what to rights say do you no, want? no, what no right? disparity is what rights there are there are, there are three key rights mm. first when a child is born mothers are given parental rights but fathers aren't I think that's wrong. I think both mothers and fathers should have rights from the moment. What do you mean by that? There's a right called parental. It's called parental responsibility, but it's a right to make decisions about health, about the religion of your child, and so on and so forth. It's automatically given to all mothers. It is not given to all fathers. And there's only two ways. Married couples. There's only two, no. There's only two ways that a father can automatically get it. One is by being granted it by the mother when she marries him. The other is being being, being by granted it by the state. And the state gives us. That's the first thing. Right. We're, we're treated differently as, uh, because of our sex. Okay. The second thing is then all, this, all the support the state puts in terms of uh, child benefits and other kind of supports goes directly to the mother, not the father. And that says basically, mother, you're the primary carer. And the third key thing is in terms of parental leave rights. The Labour, last Labour government introduced the most unequal parental leave rights in the world. They made them mother's rights not parents, parents' rights. So a couple, when they sit down and make the choice about who's going to actually take on the responsibility of bringing up this child, they're forced into making certain decisions, unless there's a massive income disparity between the mother and the father. My daughter's 16 now. I was at home for the first three years of her life. It was easier to make that decision back in the last century, 1997, than it would be now, because actual parental rights were a lot more equal back in the 90s, but they were less generous. Yeah. <laughs> Men can see beyond, even if a man has fewer uh, rights, as you're saying, and quite rightly, we need to look at that. Men can see beyond that. When they come home, and, and if both partners are working, or if mum is at home as a mother, men can come home and still help out. They have the intelligence to and see past the fact that perhaps and they, do. they don't have that right. Is that not happening? Right. Is um, yeah. is that not happening? Uh, no, it is not happening. Again, as I said, I, eight carry, out of carry. Women It's do also the case, though, that in... Even in, even in heterosexual households where there, is no, where there are no children, women do two-thirds of the housework. Do they really? They do, and that's, that's right he across said, the Western world. He said, surprised. It's also yeah. the case that, that as women earn more, once they start to earn more, more than the man, mm. they actually take on more housework. So, so you can sort of do less as you earn more, but as soon as you overtake him then you end up doing more housework and more childcare than he does, which is a sort of interesting anomaly. Isn't it? Yeah. The other thing that we need to be really aware of 
is that men and women have different views about what's fair. So that women tend to see fairness in terms of doing equal amounts. Yes. So, that, so that, you know, there's a certain amount of work being done. Some of it's paid work, some of it's work with the children. And the women will see hours put in mm. in equal terms as fairness. What men tend to feel is that they can buy themselves out of childcare by earning more. And so they will come in and they will come home and they won't muck in necessarily because they feel that their fair contribution comes from higher earnings. And so we've got a whole lot of very complex things going on it's because about how we think about fairness, which do not match. Okay. And, and absolutely because they Pardon? undervalue that the mother who maybe is at home at yeah. that point is not doing as much work, which is absolutely not Sometimes when the men case. do a little bit of housework and are praised for it, they're kind of canonised. Oh, I, well, yeah, and <laughs> that, which is why yeah. I will not say about, the, the, about the, the, the good men who are doing their share. Thank you. They right. are the good Alison, women. Why, why would you call them their share anyway? Well, Alison, exactly, I, I wouldn't call them the good Liz, women. I, I promise I, you. They're not exceptional. Uh, That's what they should be doing. Yeah, the, the norm. Yeah, the default position. Alison, you're worried about men being emasculated, aren't you? What do you mean? Well, I am, because I think sometimes we tend to sort of think that uh, uh, men are just sort of pushed aside because of these very strong women. But actually, in, in, in my own family, I see my son doing a huge amount of childcare um, and uh, all sorts of things. I mean, if there's a nappy to be changed, then he'll go and do it with that. Never, never gives a second thought to it. And I, don't, I didn't see my husband doing quite that. So I think you know, over 20, 30, 40 years, we've moved a long way in more and more men doing things, but we mustn't go so far as to push men into feeling that they are uh, less important, less valuable, less w of less worth than women. Um, why would they feel why that? Why would a man that? who is changing his child's nappy feel that that act is somehow making him less of a man or less valuable to, to, the, to the projects of raising that child? I, I don't see why you would consider that to be a threat to masculinity, to I, be more I, involved. I think we are in danger of, of women being so forceful today in saying, this is what you're going to do. Where is this danger? Where is this danger? Okay. It's sitting on the front row. <laughs> the front row. <laughs> these, are, these are fathers over here. They're the ones who are asking to be involved. They want to be involved. It's not women pushing them into it. It's the men themselves. And, it's and I think but I want if I the men just, to be involved. If I could just add that actually if there was shared parental leave which we've talked about a lot if men and women both had their time at home with the child then they could make up their own minds about whether it was yes. for them or not and how it would work in exactly. their family at the, the moment they don't the have the chance have it the is also the around the house children. what works for each individual Precisely. couple and in my own household my husband happens to be a lot better uh, at doing yeah. the yard work, uh, and I am better um, at organising the birthday party. You're so forceful. Are you coming to... <laughs> the gentleman back there. In uh, Britain could do a lot better, I think, with drawing men into childcare and parenthood. But uh, mm. as a father and now a grandfather, I have some experience of trying this myself. There are a couple of obstacles that which one should mention. Um, one is that women are far safer than men in nearly all respects. They're safer drivers, uh, they commit less violent crime, and that's reflected in caring relationships, that men who care for children are much more likely to abuse them sexually or, ph or physically. That doesn't mean all men, but you look at the statistics, it's true that men are more riskier. Catherine, you made a, you made a, a, a face of anguish. <laughs> <laughs> and pain when that uh, our, our friend said that my baby son is eight months old and when he was four months old I went back to work full-time and my husband took additional parental leave for three months which he's just coming to the end of less than one percent of couples in the country at the moment do that and I think partly it's about visibility that being known about um, but when he went to make the request and he works for in a government department large organization when he meant to, went to make the request for leave They'd never heard of it in the HR department. Mm. And then they really? granted it to him, really, and then they granted it to him as though they were doing him a favour. Yeah. And he was very much reassured by everybody that um, it wouldn't at all affect his position and he would be able to come back in and they weren't looking adversely at it at all. The sort of culture that I thought was from the 70s that still prevails, even in progressive uh, you know, clear thinking organisations. Now, our experience has been, I think my husband has a newfound appreciation for the workplace after three months at home <laughs> because it is hard work it is rewarding but it is hard work but my baby son bless him will come to me and love me but he will now equally come to my husband love him be with him and we are stronger as a family well, that's, yeah a be it's better as a result cole like, you've got it's... you've got I think, four children yeah including got, tri triplets uh, 16 year old and three 12 year old three 12 tri 
triplets. Yes. My goodness. Um, what a joy they are. Yeah, I'm sure and they, they are. Jumped, but they are now. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard work. Yes. And I, and I want to say very clearly that being a father does not emasculate a man. It can be the making of a man, actually. Absolutely. Um, there, there isn't, there isn't a... Thank you. There isn't, there isn't a man in the country who can stand up and say, I did enough without getting attacked, actually, because you can never do enough. And I know full well uh, that certain people will be watching this programme and saying, uh -huh, yeah, uh, because I didn't do enough. <laughs> but I was caught up in a crisis, uh, particularly with, when, the, when, the, when the three came, uh, and that forced me to reevaluate how I felt about it and wh how much I would get involved. And you know what? At the end of wh when our time comes, there's no man who sits there and says, uh, well... I'm glad I didn't spend more time with my no, children. No. no, it's the greatest thing. And, and, it, and I think it's been, you know, if there's anything to make, it's been the making of me. Because, you know, they, they are fantastic and they have taught me a great deal. It's a terrible struggle sometimes. I think for, women, for both of us. Women often... Um, any audience? Oh, Owen, do you want to make a quick contribution to this? Well, do you think it's interesting that what it is to be a man is in static? And mm. the changing role of men has to do a lot, and I don't think you'll like this, but to do I'm sure with women... <laughs> with, the women, with the women's movement and the LGBT movement, it's changed what it's to be, to be a man. Men are more likely now to talk about their feelings, not enough. They're more likely yeah. to spend time with their children. They're more likely to have female friends on an equal footing as them, to have gay friends for that matter. And although they're not by any means doing enough around the, the, the house, you still, I mean, the number of house husbands has gone up to 10%, so it's increased hugely from a very low base. But what it is to be a man has changed for the better because women, as a movement, and LGBT people have changed what to be a man. And that's a good thing. That's something to be embraced. Yep, you say that. Oh, go on, Alison. Yeah, go on. You know, was it you, Alison? I heard a voice from over there. Can I, tell I just you make, make an observation? My, <laughs> yeah. my, my cousin and her husband had their first child last night. It was born, a baby girl born last night. Oh, congratulations. In, uh, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, congratulations to them all. But the child was born in Norway, where they've both been working for the last couple of years. And so both mother and father are sorting out these huge periods of parental leave. Um, and that is going to change, of course, the first few months of their life and this child's life. And I think that's a very healthy arrangement. But of course, <coughs> so there's going to be flexible working at home, is there? Well, that kind of um, you know, regulation and, and state involvement in the laws around that is one thing. But the other side of the, side of the argument that Owen was, was talking about is just being a, a decent person, being someone who was brought up well to do your fair share to help out, to be selfless, not selfish. I don't think that requires too many carrots and sticks, apart from you know, when you're raising your children. Just doing it. Do it without being asked. Is that lady there? Yeah. Hours. Allow me. Lady there. Yes. Good morning. Yeah, I Hello. Need to say, like, um, is it Anne? Yeah, I just think it's a bit ludicrous to say it's a threat to masculinity because you chose to bring a child into this world. If you're not willing to get hands-on and get involved as a woman does, then, then why put yourself in that situation? Mm. And I do think intentions are, are good for many people, but it's the behaviour that takes time to catch up. Mm. Interesting, the point you made about the historical issue of, of, of slavery and this whole long thing. Honestly, it's incredible how behaviour takes a long time to catch up to the good intentions that, it, that many men have that I do want to help is more. Is it different in different the communities and are very complex? Absolutely. Because I was going to say that, you know, growing up in the household I grew up in, we had to do everything. You know, my parents had this philosophy that from you can pick up a broom, you learn to sweep. You know, if you can hold a scouring pad, you scour a pot. And you had to learn to do everything, and that's how I've raised my children and my grandchildren I've as raised well. my children as well. Because then it doesn't become such an issue. So there may well be exactly. government, you know, whatever it is, things that are in the way so you don't get the paternity leave, etc. Mm. But culturally, you're prepared for that. Yeah. So when it does come, it should be a better society. Glenn, I think that's spot on, but I want to pick out one particular point here about the way we've actually framed this question. We haven't got a lot we of time. OK, we talked <laughs> earlier about why is it that black people aren't involved in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question to ask. It's a really good way to frame it. What is wrong with the institution that mm. has black people not show up mm. equally? We frame this question, what's wrong with men? Yeah. Why are men yeah. shirking? What's the yeah. problem with men? Our whole conversation around gender in this country frames conversation around gender by saying, Men are problems and women have problems. We've got to change yeah. that mentality. So we should it's, have it's said fathers are doing their fair share, aren't they? No, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't say our mothers, <laughs> our mothers shirking their fair share. When, when fathers bring home about two-thirds yeah. of, the, of the income mm -hmm. in, in families and they do about the third of the care, we don't say our women not doing their fair share in the workplace. We don't say that, but we say our men doing their fair That's share. That's a debate, though, doesn't it? Of course it does, yeah. but we need to go beyond that, Nicky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need yeah, to yeah. go beyond yeah. that. It gets yeah. us started, the language we, we use is, is all important. The phraseology we have is all important. I absolutely uh, take that point. Uh, listen, uh, we're yeah. out of time, so thank you all very much for taking part, and give yourselves a round of applause. I think it was
terrifically interesting debate. As always, debates uh, will continue online on our Twitter. Next week's special on the First World War. Did it change Britain for the better? Goodbye from the big questions. Have a great Sunday.